Man, I am thrilled that you guys are here. Can we give it up for our worship team again too? Man, oh man. Goodness sakes. Good stuff, good stuff. Hey, I wanna do one thing for us real quick too before we get uh, too far into today's sermon. Um, go ahead and grab out your phone real quick. I know you have a phone, so I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait until I see the, the, the ghoulish blue light on our faces, right? Like the, uh. pull out your phone, go open up your Facebook app because I know you have a phone and I know you got Facebook. So open up your Facebook app and I want you to search for Cornerstone Church. And then what I want you to do is share this feed. You'll see our video come up. Just share it to your feed. Just share it to your feed. Um, we had a, a lady get uh, baptized in first service, uh, Sheila Boyd. Her testimony, my goodness, if you missed it, uh, I would say get back online quickly and watch it because my, it was just so, so good. Part of her testimony was that how she found Cornerstone Church was through a Google search, just doing a Google search for non-denominational churches in Akron. And she found us and she started watching our services and was just kind of captivated by, by the worship, by the sermon, by the people here. Um, and so whenever I say share the services, I'm not saying because I want people on your feed to see me. I'm not saying that because I want our numbers to look good. I'm saying that because you literally have no idea who you can be influencing through doing that. It may seem stupid. It may seem little to you. Like, uh, why do I need to share it? Really? It's a big deal. You have no idea who it can impact. So what I would say to you, just make that a regular habit. Every Sunday morning, you just get on your phone, a service is starting, and you hit share on the service because you have no idea the lives that you can change by that one simple thing. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for following us on social media and helping us spread the word about what God is doing uh, here at Cornerstone. Hey, I am so excited, but it's, it's also kind of bittersweet uh, that we're ending the series today, uh, emojis. I've been loving saying that word and the fact that I don't get to say it anymore is a real bummer, uh, a real disappointment. But uh, this series has been discussing just the, the critical aspect of our emotional health. Emotions are important. Emotions are critical. They have so much power over your life, over the people in your life. They can determine so many things about how your life goes out. We need to have emotional health. Church, I can't say this enough. We need emotional health. We talked about this in week one of this series, that the fact of the matter is a lot of people, you included, in fact, I would dare say most people, like 99% of people, would rather spend time around emotionally healthy non-believers than emotionally crippled Christians. That's just the fact of the matter. Uh, a lot of people would rather be married to those kind of people. A lot of people would rather work for those people and be neighbors for those people with, with people who don't know anything of Jesus, but at least they're emotionally healthy rather than people who claim Jesus all the day long, but they are constantly lashing out at people. They're constantly bitter and resentful and have zero check on their moods. That is how critical, that's how important, that's how vital our emotions are and that we get them in check. We will drag our life down and others' lives if we don't do so. Now, this is something I wanna say real quick from the onset, and this is something that we've talked about in every single one of the weeks of this series. And I don't want you coming out of here today and people ask, you know, what, what, what's your church talking about? What'd your pastor say? And you say, uh, my pastor's talking about how feelings are bad and, you know, our emotions are bad and they lie to us and moods are bad. That is not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. It's not what I've said any week throughout this series. Emotions are not bad. Feelings aren't bad. Moods aren't bad. In fact, not only are they not bad, they're the opposite. They're good. <laughs> Like they're a good thing, emotions, feelings, moods, they're a good thing, they're a God thing, and they're an appropriate thing. Like they're, they're good for us to have. Like it's good for us to have emotions and moods. Um, what comes into play though, is how do we manage them, All right? I would say that that's probably true for most of life. Whenever we look at life in general, um, a lot of the things that we have are appropriate and God-given things. In fact, I've heard a pastor put it this way, sin is when you try to meet a godly desire in an ungodly way, right? And so whenever you look at our lives and you look at uh, the things in our lives, a lot of the stuff that we have are God-given, appropriate, fantastic things, but how are we managing them? So let me give you an example, family. Family is an appropriate thing, it's a God-given thing, it's a wonderful thing, but there's probably some people in here, some people watching online, whenever I said family, 
you tensed up a little bit <laughs> because your family makes you tense because there's, there's divisions and there's grudges and there's burnt bridges and there's things that have been said and there's hurts that have been made. And so the, these things, you're like, oh, man. So families, I mean, they're, they're great. They're a God-given thing. Yet there's so many broken families. Yet there's so many uh, messy divorces. Yet there's so many brothers and sisters who don't talk to each other anymore and haven't seen each other at holidays for years because this appropriate God-given thing has been mismanaged to death. The same thing is true with sex. Sex is this incredible God-given thing, right? This, this awesome thing that God has given mankind, yet how often do we just abuse the crap out of it? How often do we mismanage it and, and pervert it and turn it into this just awful uh, dishonoring thing, right? It's an appropriate God-given thing that we mismanage. Same thing is true with some of our natural skills. Man, there are some people who are just so charismatic and they've been that way since they were a baby, right? They're just like really outgoing, very charismatic. And that's just a natural God-given skill. It's like a personality trait that the person has, but they mismanage it. And so later on in life, they use that charisma and they mismanage it uh, and they end up uh, uh, deceiving people with it or trying to use people with it, trying to get in people's good graces to be able to get what they want with it. All of these good, appropriate, God-given things, but they're mismanaged. Which brings me to this. I think this is a safe assumption to say um, everybody wants happiness and fulfillment in life. I think that's a pretty safe assumption online. Anybody, I don't, I don't see anyone that, no, I want to be miserable <laughs> my whole life. In fact, there is so much, think about it, everything divides us anymore. Like we can't agree on, on anything. That might be one of the only unifying qualities of mankind. <laughs> that we all, every single person wants happiness out of life, wants fulfillment out of life. Um, we're all there, we're all in the same boat. And here's the thing, it's not just us that want that for ourselves. God wants that for you. Yeah, yeah. Like, like God wants you to have a fulfilling life. I didn't say a prosperous life, right? Not prosperity gospel, but God wants you to have a fulfilling life. Like he, he wants you to not just like manage and kind of get through until your death. No, he's wanting you to live a life full of purpose and full of fulfillment. So, so here we have us wanting fulfillment and, and happiness out of life. We want to experience those emo emotions and moods and feelings more often than not. And then not just us, but God wants that for us too. So here's my question. Why do we so rarely get there? <laughs> right? I mean, why, why do we so, if, if we want that, if we want happiness and joy to be the, the, the definer of our life more often than not, and if not just us, but God wants that for us too, the most powerful, the ultimate being, the Alpha and Omega wants that for us too, why are so many of us just settling in for dysfunction? Why are so many of us just in places where our emotions are just terrible and they're rotten and they tear down our relationships and they burn bridges and they hurt people and they hurt ourselves? Why are we there if we want something better and God wants something better for us. I think the answer is something that we touched on last week. Last week, one of the points we made was um, about this series that there might be some people who think, man, a church is talking about emotions and feelings. This sounds like self-help therapy or something like that. This sounds like a Dr. Phil episode or a book that you would pick up about the, the power of positive thinking, right? It sounds, sounds like something like that. Why are we talking about it here at church? And the reason we're talking about it and the reason we're discussing it is because you may think that and you may not put a bunch of value on your emotions, but your enemy does. So you may feel like, well, this is crap. Why are we even focusing on this? This stuff is ridiculous. Our emotions, we're getting in our feelings. You can think that all the day long, but the devil knows where your goat is tied. And he's like, hey, that's, that's great. Don't worry about it. Don't think about your emotions. Don't actually try to dive into them at all. You just keep writing them out. You just keep feeling what you're feeling. You just keep going with whatever mood or attitude hits you on a certain day, and you're playing right into my hands. So you may not care too much about your emotions, but your enemy does. And this idea is the one that we're going to be unpacking today as we hop into the sermon. So are you guys ready? Ready. ready. Great. Well, we don't do this all the time, but occasionally we, we do. I'm going to ask you if you're physically able to go ahead and stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to be reading from the book of 1 Peter. This is a letter that was written by Peter, one of Jesus's disciples. He followed Jesus for three years, continued following him after his death 
and resurrection. This is Peter writing to some Christians and he's telling them how they should behave and how they should approach life. And this is a fantastic word for us today. This is 1 Peter starting uh, in chapter five, starting in verse six. Peter tells us this, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. That makes me feel comfortable because I know that me being lifted up, I know that me getting to that fulfilling future isn't on me, <laughs> right? I, I don't know about you. I don't want that responsibility on my shoulders. And what scripture is telling me is, hey, if I humble myself, I can just trust everything with God. I can trust that he will lift me up in due time. Verse seven, man, how beautiful is this? Cast all your anxiety on him. How much? All. How much? All. all, all. Cast all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. One of the most beautiful passages in all of scripture, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Verse eight, be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Isn't that amazing how whenever you know that you're not the only one going through something, it makes you feel better? <laughs> Not because you're like, well, good, it's happening to them too, but because there's just, there's this camaraderie that, you know, man, I'm not, not only am I not going through this alone, but chances are there's someone who's not going through this. They've gone through this and they've got to the other side and they're still intact and they're still honoring God. And it gives you a kind of confidence when you know that. And then Peter closes it out this way in verse 10 and 11. He says, and the God of all grace, if you do all these things, if you humble yourself, if you cast your cares on God, if you are alert and of sober mind, then the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you. He will make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. So good. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. As I read that, one thing that really stuck out to me as I'm reading this is the devil is not a good hunter. <laughs> like he, he's not a good hunter um, because scripture just told us what? Uh, be alert and a sober mind. And your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour now, I'm not like an expert in lionology. I don't even know, <laughs> don't even know if that's a thing, right? Like I don't, I don't study lions for a living, but I, I did read up a little bit on them after reading this verse just to find out a little bit about their hunting habits, things like that. And as I was reading about them, you, you see that lions, whenever they hunt, how they hunt, it's all about stealth, right? You may remember the Lion King, Mufasa teaching Simba how to hunt. And he's going up on Zazu, he's being real quiet, and he's downwind and everything, right? That, that's how, I love that that's where my like knowledge of, well, how lions actually hunt, if the Lion King is to believe, be believed. Um, but th that's how they hunt. And this is, this is interesting. This is why they hunt that way. Lions are actually slower than almost every kind of prey they go after. Pretty much everything that they eat on the food chain is quicker than they are. <laughs> so they need stealth. They need to be able to sneak up. Most lions won't even make their pounce, won't even make their attack until they're at least 30 meters or closer to their prey because they can't catch up with them. So whenever I read this and I'm like, okay, so lions, they hunt, they look for something to devour in silence, in stealth. Then I read scripture says, your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Um, lions don't roar as they hunt, <laughs> it botches the whole plan. The, the whole point is stealth, <laughs> right? So the, the devil, he, he's a bad hunter. You see, because why a lion roars, the whole point behind their roar is to give themselves away. That's it. Like if they're roaring, a, a lion's roar can actually be heard about five miles away by the human ear. Think about that five miles away. It's loud. There's no mistaking it. There is nothing subtle about the roar of a lion, right? And so whenever scripture says that Satan, he's walking around like a roaring lion, to me, I'm going, man, he's, he's a bad hunter. He's giving himself away. He essentially, Satan is showing us his cards, right? He's a bad hunter. He, he is giving himself away. He's showing his cards. We know what he's up to. We just need to be alert and of sober mind to recognize it. We have to be alert and of sober mind to actually recognize what 
he's doing. So let's keep that in mind. The devil is a bad hunter. I want you to tuck that away for a minute as we move on. So um, I want to talk about appetites real quick for a second. Has anyone ever been hangry? Hangry. Yes. My people. Some of you look a little hangry right now. You probably didn't get breakfast and you're like, can this dude shut up so we can get to lunch, right? Um, Hangry. It's that combination of hunger and anger, right? You're, you're so hungry, you're starting to get a little testy. You're so hungry, you're starting to get a little frustrated and like, all right, can we move this on? Can we get going? I, I'm, I'm hungry. I need to get some food in my stomach. Um, there's a meme that went around for a while that I was like, man, I relate to this way too much. Uh, it said, if I say I'm hungry, we got about 17 minutes before I become a different person. Like <laughs> the clock is running. Like I'm about to change if we don't get some food in my stomach. I felt personally attacked by that. I'm like, that is me. (laughs) Um, The funny thing is, is that 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 sensation of being hangry, of being hungry, it comes from uh, our appetite, right? That's literally what our appetite is. Our appetite is this God-given notification that he's wired into our body where whenever our body is requiring nutrients or it's requiring uh, 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 water, anything like that, our body literally sends a signal, like our our brain sends a signal, our stomach sends signals to let us know, hey, you need something in your stomach. You're requiring this kind of vitamin. You're requiring this kind of nutrient, this kind of food. Um, And so it's alerting us. An appetite is a God-given alert. It's a notification telling us there is something we need to be paying attention to. And it's something that we, God has put us in charge of managing to a degree, right? Our appetite, we have to manage it. And there's different ways we can choose to manage it. I brought out uh, some, some little snacks to show. We got a pineapple, any pineapple fans? There we go, we got some bananas. <laughs> Who wants a pineapple? Who <laughs> Just chuck a 10 pound pineapple out into the crowd. We, do, we paid our insurance premium for the month, right? <laughs> um, some carrots, right? There we go. Some carrots with some other good stuff. Some water, just some nice H2O. Then we got some lemons, lemons and limes and an apple. Just some, you know, good, healthy stuff, right? These are all um, different, like, good ways that we can manage our hunger, right? Like, if you've, if you've got the hunger, you get that notification, you get that alert of appetite of, like, hey, you need to get something in your stomach, your body's requiring this. We manage that, and this is how we can choose to manage it. Or not. <laughs> this isn't the like, extent of the food pyramid, right? There's, there's more things. And a lot of the stuff that we really like actually is at the very tippy top of the food pyramid, <laughs> the stuff that we're really not supposed to incorporate a lot. Um, but here, here's some other things that we can do whenever we're feeling hungry. Um, we can break these bad boys out, right? Here we go. You should have, guys, you should have heard first service. When I broke these chips out and whenever this made an appearance, First, you would have thought revival was happening in here. People running up and down the aisle, shouting me down, glory, hallelujah, right? Um, and we were laughing. We were like, man, could you even imagine if someone just now logged into the service online? Like, this church is weird. They're like shouting down food. Um, some Swiss cake rolls. These things are so good. Take you right back to childhood. It's all about taking you right back to childhood. The little hugs, little hug chugs. Man, who needs water when you got a hug chug, right? These things are so good. A little hug chug, and then, you know, your classic staples, your peanut M&Ms, so good, your Kit Kat. Oh, man, I'm, like I'm getting hungry right now. I'm actually salivating. Snickers, and look, Snickers even lets you know it satisfies. <laughs> you're, you got an appetite, man, you're, you're hungry. You're not, what's, what's the saying? Not feeling yourself? Not feeling yourself? Snickers, right? It satisfies. It will get you where you need to be. So we have two options, Right? We get this God-given notification, appetite, you're hungry, you need nutrients, you need something, this is, this is a good thing, this is a God thing, and we have one or two ways to manage it. We can put some good stuff in, or we can put the real good stuff in, right? We can, put, we can put the stuff that looks so good. But you know what happens every single time we put this stuff in, it tastes so good, doesn't it? Man, it tastes so good going down. Once it hits your lips, right? It's like, ooh, it's so good. It tastes so good. 
And then in about 15 minutes, right, not feeling yourself, have a Snickers. And all those commercials, it shows the people changing, they become better again. They're like, you're better now? And they're like, yeah, yeah, better. Yeah, better for about 15 minutes. <laughs> then you're hungry again. Then you're feeling frustrated. Then the sugar high is suddenly coming down and you're right back where you started off before, maybe even a little worse than you were. The same is true with our emotions. The same is true with our moods. The same is true with our feelings. It's actually shocking how similar emotions and appetite are. They're both these things that are God-given urges, right? They're they're a thing that he's programmed and hardwired into our body, an appetite and an emotion. Um, There's nothing wrong with them on the face value. Uh, They both come and go. Right? You can have a, a craving for a certain kind of food. You can have an appetite for like just one thing that just sounds so good, right? You can have this craving, this appetite, and then it will just dissipate. It'll go. The same thing will happen with an emotion. You can be so sad, so depressed, so bitter, so angry, so resentful, so happy, and then it's gone, right? They both come and go, and both of them are so unbelievably strong. <laughs> have you noticed that? Man, whenever you are hungry, it's like you can't think about anything else. Whenever you're mad, whenever you're frustrated, whenever you're depressed, it's like you can't think about anything else. Whenever you're going through grief, it's like you can't think about anything else. It's so strong. It's so all-consuming. So here we have our emotions, this appropriate God-given thing. There's nothing wrong with it on its face value, but how do we manage it? How how do we manage our appetite? Do we put in the good stuff or the bad stuff? How do we handle our emotions? How do we handle our moods? How do we handle our feelings? Do we put in the good stuff or the bad stuff? What do we put into our body? You see, we we know what the enemy wants us to do, right? Like we're we're aware of what the enemy wants to do. Uh, Again, he's a roaring lion. He has showed us his cards. Like he's, he's not playing this real tricky game of like, oh, I'm going to sneak up on them. And, and they're, I have people wondering about this all the time. Like, man, I'm so worried that I'll, I'll sin or I'll make the wrong decision and I'll, I'll end up sinning. I'm like, no, you, you really don't have to worry about that. If you're truly seeking God and you're truly asking him, God, help me not to make a misstep step as I seek your will. He'll show it to you. Like you don't need to be worried that, oh, the devil, man, everything about it looked good and godly, but the devil just snatched me away. Man, God will reveal things to you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He guides you, right? He guides you on the ways that you should go. And the devil, he ain't that subtle. He's not that subtle. Like he, he is a roaring lion. He has showed us his cards. Let me ask you, is it hard to identify what's the healthy food up here? <laughs> like, it's, it's, let me give you a hint. It's the stuff that if I leave it out for a day or two, it will go bad, right? You can come back next, you can come back next year and this thing's gonna be as good as it is today, right? Like this thing will still hit that same way, man, we still got some Halloween candy that like you'll find out in the basement. Ooh, yeah, all right, Milky Way. And it still tastes perfect, right? <laughs> There's something wrong with that. <laughs> that it can just sit around for that long. It's very easy to know what's good and what's bad. The devil has showed his cards. We know that what he offers us to manage our moods and our feelings and our emotions, man, it is a, it's a problematic prescription, <laughs> It is a problematic prescription that he offers us to try to take to help our moods. What what the devil is, he is Dr. Feelgood. He's the one they call Dr. Feelgood. I was going to ask the band if they could learn that song, and I thought it might be slightly inappropriate for church on Sunday morning. I don't know. (laughs) But, But Satan, the devil, man, he is Dr. Feelgood. What he wants to do, what his prescription is, is ignore this and just, just look at how good this tastes. Look at how good this is. Oh, it just looks amazing. He's Dr. Feelgood. He wants you to do what will feel good in the moment. He wants to give you what looks tasty. He wants to give you what you want to hear. He wants to offer you something that on the front, guess what? All of this stuff, all of these things, it cost me like nothing. This stuff was so cheap. All the candy bars were like less than a dollar. All this was pretty cheap. Guess what was expensive? All this. I think just this pineapple was like $4. I'm like, hey, Louise, like it's expensive stuff, right? So he wants you to see stuff and go, man, this doesn't cost that much. This stuff is, it's cheap. It doesn't hurt you. But in the end, his stuff, his prescription, it hurts more than it helps. In fact, all it does is hurt. It's a facade. So why do we fall for it? Why, why, Why do we fall for it? 
Like if we know that this is wrong, if we know, we literally call these things junk food. That's what we call them as we consume endless amounts of them, right? Like that's me. I will, I'll kill a sleeve of this without even thinking, right? I, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld who talked about the reason that Oreos are in rows is so you have to have that momentary pause after you finish one whole sleeve to go, God, what am I doing with my life? Like, <laughs> it gives you that out. It just gives you that quick, like, what, is, what am I doing? <laughs> and so we'll go through these things. We'll just, we'll, we'll kill these because it, it looks so good and it seems like it doesn't cost too much. But man, in the end, it hurts us, but we fall for it time and time again. And that's because the devil knows, our enemy knows, man, people just want joy. They don't care how unhealthy it is. They don't, under, they, they don't care if it's even true joy. They just want that feeling. They just want that emotion. They just want that mood, even if it is so fleeting. So why have this that kind of tastes, you know, it tastes good, but it's gotta be really fresh. It's gotta be the, the right ripeness. It's gotta, it's gotta be perfect. Why do that whenever you can have this Snickers that you can just hang around forever and it'll always taste good, right? But he knows he knows we fall for it because we just want what feels good. We're so desperate for joy. We're so desperate for happiness that we will latch on to anybody or anything that seems to promise better for us. That's why we'll have those momentary binge eating sessions. It's why we'll say things that tear others down, but it makes us feel good in the moment. It's why we'll go to social media craving attention. It's why we'll binge watch uh, series on Netflix and Disney Plus. It's why we'll tell lies about people because making them look bad makes us feel better. It's why we avoid handling situations that we know we should handle because in the moment it feels better to just not even worry about it and just focus on something else. The devil is Dr. Feel Good. That's his prescription. That's the food he wants to peddle to us. And what this is, this is medical malpractice. This will get us killed. If this is your prescription for every time you have a mood, every time you have a, an attitude or a feeling, anything, an emotion, and the devil's saying, hey, just run with it. You feel mad, you feel angry, you should be angry. I can't believe they did that to you. Hold that grudge, burn that bridge. You're resentful, you have every right to be resentful. I cannot believe they said that to you. Oh, you're, you're struggling with depression? You should be. Man, things are going so hard for you and it's so unfair. You didn't deserve any of this. He just wants you to stuff your face with this prescription that will kill you. It will kill you, it will kill all the people around you and it will kill your witness. You will be one of those Christians that people say, I would rather be around an emotionally healthy unbeliever than uh, uh, you who claim Jesus, but you are so emotionally crippled, I can't even be around you because you are constantly draining and sucking the life out of me. The devil's prescription, it never gets us where we want to be. It always is going to kill us. Like scripture says, he is looking for someone to devour. He's not just trying to hurt us. He's not just trying to, you know, make life a struggle sometimes. He wants to devour you. He wants your life to be meaningless. He wants your witness to be destroyed. He wants you to make a decision that will ruin your reputation and ruin your life and ruin your family and ruin your witness because you were in a mood. He wants you to, to do something. And how, I mean, we can think of the people who have just destroyed their life because they were feeling a certain way one day. He knows where our goat is tied. He, he may not be a smart hunter, but man, he knows where to find the food. He may not be smart, but he knows where we're at and he knows where our goat is tied and he goes for it. So thank God he at least is a bad hunter and thank God he at least shows his cards so we know what he's doing. He gives himself away. He gives himself in a way so that we know his stuff is junk. We know what he's peddling us will not help us. We know at a core level, we know, man, talking bad about people just, it hurts. <laughs> like this doesn't hurt them. It hurts me. It hurts the way people see me. It just, it hurts. Man, lying about people and lying about situations and being bitter and holding on to resentment, it just hurts. Thank God the devil has showed his cards and we know that all of those things aren't a healthy way to live. Even people who don't claim Jesus would say, yeah, I mean, if, if you're just bitter your whole life, that's not gonna lead you anywhere good. 
Thank God the devil is a poor hunter and he gives himself away. And thank God on the opposite side, God is a great physician. God is a good, good doctor. And he does what a good doctor does. He tells us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear, right? Because what we want to hear oftentimes isn't what we need to hear. What we want to hear is that, oh, well, it's only 250 calories. I mean, that's not, that's not bad. That's not too bad. And I mean, I've walked today, so I probably already like worked this thing off. That's what we want to hear, right? That's what we want to hear. God, he's a good doctor though. He's a good doctor. He's a great physician. And so he tells us exactly as it is. Like, hey, look, you, you do this stuff, it's going to kill you. <laughs> it may take time. You may not notice it immediately, but it, it's going to take you out. This is what you need. If you want to not just survive life, but thrive life, this is what you need. He tells us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. It'd be like your doctor telling you like, hey, look, I know that the scan came back. Yeah, you got cancer. But you know, I mean, I have people come in here every day and they end up being okay. So this kind of cancer, it's not super deadly. So I wouldn't really worry about it. I, I wouldn't put you on any treatment plan or anything. If a doctor told you that, you would instantly go out to a second opinion, like instantly. Like, and you would probably never go back to that doctor again. But that is what Satan pushes on us every single day when it comes to our moods. It's not that big of a deal that you're still dealing with that. It's not that big of a deal that you still harbor hatred in your heart for that person. That's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Everybody has those people in their life that they don't like. Everybody has those people. Don't worry about it. You're fine. That's what the devil pushes on us. God, though, is a good doctor. He tells us what we need to hear, and we just read it. First Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, we hear what we need to know if we want to be emotionally healthy. And so I'm going to run through these in our last uh, uh, about 10 minutes together. Um, first off, this is one of the things we need to realize as we read from First Peter whenever it comes to our emotional health. One of the reasons that Satan, one of the reasons the enemy, his prescription is so problematic and it doesn't work is because it lacks perspective. There is no perspective in what the devil pushes on you. Everything is about right here, right now. Everything he offers you is, man, don't these chips taste good? Man, these Swiss cake rolls, aren't they so good? That's, it's all about how you're going to feel as you're eating it and not even a second thought about how you'll feel after the last bite is taken. He, he doesn't want you to think about that. The prescription he gives lacks perspective. And so this is how we combat that. This is what scripture says in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourselves. Humble yourself. There is probably no greater foundation for a Christian to put their faith on than just humility. Humility. And humility, what that truly means is an accurate view of who I am. That I am I'm a sinner who needs a savior. I, I am someone who's been redeemed and bought at high price. And, and I, I'm now accepted and secure and significant because of Jesus and what he's done for me. We need Humility, because when we have humility, whenever we have an appropriate view of ourselves, we realize Satan is a, he, he's a stupid uh, hunter, but we're stupid prey a lot of the times. <laughs> like we can, we can be prey that just walks right into a trap because we, we know this is bad. How many times have you lied and felt great about it? How many times have you gossiped or tore someone down or, or just said hateful, angry things and afterwards you're like, man, that was great. Can't wait to do this again. Who else, who else can I tear down? This is awesome. It doesn't happen. And going into that decision, you know it doesn't feel good. But you still do it. I still do it. And it's in those moments that I do it that I realize I am not humble enough. Because I think that I can like just kind of handle this stuff on my own. I think that my emotions and my moods, I'm qualified enough to handle this. And well, I'm different than everybody else. So for me, this lie isn't that bad. Well, I'm different than anybody else. So for me, this isn't gossip. I'm different than anyone else. So things are always different for me. We need humility. We need to realize, man, no, I, I fall for just terrible prescriptions all the time. Knowing they're terrible going in. I fall for it all the time. We need that humility. My, my wife, Jessica, um, I'm so grateful for her. We really balance each other out in awesome ways. One of the ways we do that is I'm terrible when it comes to discernment. 
It's a very biblical, churchy word, but basically just means being able to like kind of tell how a situation's gonna go or tell a lot about someone without knowing a lot about them. Just having that kind of gut instinct, that feeling. Mine's terrible. Like I have no discernment. <laughs> like I don't, like I'm, I'm the kind of person, if I would've hung out, like if I would've been old enough to hang around Charlie Manson before everything came out, I'd be like, man, Charlie's a good guy. Old Chuck. Yeah, he's, no, he's a, good people, good people. I have terrible discernment, like just terrible. Jessica, on the other hand, man, she'll, she'll call out a situation and be like, man, I don't know about that. And then six months later, you're like, how did you know? And she's like, I, I don't know. I don't even know those people, but I just, I had a feeling about it. How silly of me would it be knowing how good she is at it to just ignore her advice and be like, no, I got this thing handled. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need her to speak into it. That would be crazy. That would be crazy. It'd be stupid, right? It takes humility to realize that and go, you know what? I'm not good here. You know what? If not for the grace of God, I'm going to fall apart here. And so, God, I need your help. We need humility. Humble ourselves under God's mighty hand, and he will lift us up. And that humility, you know what that says? That humility says, I'm, I'm going to ask you for help, God, because I'm not a good doctor, but you are. <laughs> I'm not a good physician. I, I shouldn't be prescribing my own medication when it comes to handling my moods and my emotions and my feelings, but you should because God is a great physician with a great prescription. This is what scripture says in verse seven, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all of your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Think about that. God wants all of it all of it. There's not a piece of dysfunction in your heart. There's not a, an emotion or a mood or a feeling that you have that God doesn't say, just trust me with it. Right. Just trust me with it. I, I know you feel angry and I know you feel resentful and I know you feel hurt and I know you're feeling grief. Just share it with me. Yeah. And it is amazing how whenever we do that, whenever we go to a good doctor, how things just instantly lighten up for us. Man, uh, me and Jessica, we were just driving yesterday to a wedding and on the drive, um, I was talking to her about something that was on my mind. It was just kind of like bothering me, just bothering my spirit and my soul. And I talked to her about it. The second we got done talking about it, I instantly felt better. Nothing changed. <laughs> Nothing changed. All that happened was I just offloaded my cares, my worries, my thoughts, my concerns. I offloaded them off of me to someone else, and I instantly felt better. Isn't that crazy? How much more so, if I felt better from that by sharing this with a trusted person, my wife, how much better I felt after that, how much more so when I go to God with my worries, my cares, my concerns, my feelings? Because Jessica can't do anything. <laughs> She's just my wife. She's just a person. But man, whenever I go before God, I go before his throne with these things that are worrying me because he's someone who can change me. He can change other people if they're involved. He can change the situation. He can actually do something about it. That's why scripture says, man, don't, don't cast your anxieties and your cares on other people. Don't, don't, don't go and just unload yourself. I mean, of course, there's a, there's a time and a place for counseling and there's a time and place for venting to a trusted person like your spouse or something like that. Of course, there's a time and place for that. But God's saying, man, that's what I'm for. I created you. I, I know your inmost being. I know your heart. Cast that stuff on me. You will be shocked how much better you feel. God is a great physician with a great prescription. And let me tell you, getting healthy by taking your emotions and your feelings and submitting them to God and having him help you work through those, those will get you healthy. And I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. You need to get emotionally healthy. You have to, you have to because your world depends on it and I'm not exaggerating. We have people who are being baptized today because someone else was emotionally healthy and through that, their witness of Christ affected that person. And that's why they're in relationship with Jesus today. You have no idea who's watching you. You have no idea who is seeing your outbursts on Facebook. You have no idea the people who are seeing you completely blow up at a waitress at, at, at the local restaurant. You have no idea who is watching these things and your emotional immaturity and your emotional uh, crippled nature is just killing your witness. 
It's killing it. That's why there is a running like joke, and my God, it's just terrible that for the longest time, the worst day of the week to be a waitress or a server is Sunday because they get tipped the least and the people are the rudest and they expect the most. Like that's, that, is, that is not it. That is not it. And I will tell you this much, I know there's a lot of thought about, oh, the church today, it's going to hell in a handbasket and the, the, the big C church, oh, there's so many issues with our doctrine and, oh, we give in here and we, we say too much there and blah, blah, blah. I'm telling you right now, if the church dies, which it won't, Jesus promised it wouldn't, but let's get hypothetical. If the church would die, I would promise you it's not gonna be over our doctrine not being tight enough. It's gonna be over our demeanor not being Christ-like enough. That's what will absolutely kill us. It will kill us. If our demeanor, we have perfect doctrine, but our demeanor is constant highs and lows, constantly all over the place, and people never know what they're gonna get with us. Jesus, man, he was such a stabilizing force for people. They always knew what they were gonna get from him. It didn't matter if, if it was the high of the Sermon on the Mount or the, the walk to the cross. He was the same Jesus in both of those situations. Think about that. And then here we are, you know, lashing out at people depending on if, if our Starbucks order was right or not. We have got to get emotionally healthy. Our world literally depends on it. And the way we get there is so stinking simple. This is not like a, man, what a good point. Let me write that down. It's so simple. It's just God's grace. God's grace, that is the prescription. That's, that's what we need <laughs> to put into the midst of our emotions, our feelings, our attitudes, just completely saturate it with God's grace. And, what the, and this is exactly how scripture says it. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore you and make you strong, uh, firm, and steadfast. So as we put God's grace into our life, we're stronger, we're more firm, we're steadfast, we're not weak. We don't change with every wind that blows. Every mood that comes our way doesn't throw us one way or the other. We become steadfast. God's grace is the prescription for emotional health. When we have God's grace in our life, it changes the way we treat others, the way we view others, the way we view ourselves. We are opened up to a whole new world of everything when you start seeing through the lens of God's grace. Because that anger that you have towards that person, once you have God's grace so a part of your diet, so a part of your prescription, once it's in there, man, that anger you have towards that person, that frustration, that mood that comes up, suddenly you start seeing it through a different lens. You start going, well, man, okay. <laughs> I know how I've wronged God. I know all the times I've wronged other people. Why in the world am I being this livid with this person? Why am I blowing up on this? They don't deserve this. My goodness. And it causes you to change your whole demeanor towards them. It causes you to change your demeanor towards God. It reminds you to be thankful to God for all the things he saved you from. God's grace changes everything. His grace is the prescription for emotional health. And what's so cool is God's grace does the same thing that healthy food does for our body. As we put this healthy food in our body, we start to feel right. We start to get right. And it's easier for us to get right. It's easier for us to fend off illnesses and viruses and anything like that. The more that we incorporate what should be a part of our diet into our diet, that happens. And the same thing happens with our moods and our emotions. I promise you, you start incorporating God's grace. You really get yourself immersed in it. And every day you are just astounded how God's forgiven you and that you need to show that to other people, that you need to give grace and, and truth to people. Whenever you do that, you will start noticing your moods will change. Your, your lows won't be as low as they used to be and your highs will be tethered to where they should be. They won't be too artificially high. They'll be right where they should be because you've got the right diet. <laughs> You've got the right diet and you will be more easily able to fend off things that attack you because you'll just be steadfast. You'll be firm. You'll be strong. God's grace is the prescription for emotional health. And the great news is it's free. <laughs> it's free. It, it doesn't cost an arm and a leg like this did, right? Not only is it free, that means we do nothing to earn it. That means you don't say, okay, well, let me try to get my emotional health in check first so God will be happy with me and then he'll bless me. That ain't how it works. That's not how it works at all. 
God works through his grace. You don't get this without his grace. You don't have a healthy life and emotional health without his grace completely working in your life. And what's so amazing is we have got, I'm looking out here, I see people in our midst who have experienced that, who've experienced God's grace. And what's amazing is today, we have some people who are making a public declaration that they have experienced God's grace through baptism. Isn't that exciting? We've already had four people in the 9 a.m. service. Four people in the 9 a.m. service. We have more people coming up today. I'm gonna ask you to clap one more time as we have our three getting baptized into this service come up to the stage.